thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Lord, um, we need you this morning. We need you every second of the hour. We need you, and may your words come from on high. We thank you, Lord, for this in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. So today we're continuing our study. Today we're talking about families of faith. By the way, let me ask you a question. This is kind of off, off topic. Um, does anyone have a testimony this week? You know, you should have testimonies every week that where God delivers you or does something for you. You got one, man? Just share it real, real quickly. Testimonies is great for building faith. Okay, uh, so Abby's pregnant. You guys know that. Uh, Abby had a midwife appointment. Baby was breached, so baby was head up, butt down. And uh, so she was pretty scared about that because that means a C-section, which she doesn't want to do. And so we had, we had prayed about it, and uh, we were going to do a massage to try to get the baby to flip. But we had prayed about it, and I called Pastor, or, uh, Brother James. We prayed. I sent out, I think to even you, I sent out some tech, and we prayed. And uh, by the time we got there, uh, the baby had already flipped around, and the midwives were like, how did that happen? And I'm like, in the power of prayer. Power of prayer. Amen. Praise God. That's a, that's a powerful testimony. So, and congratulations, Daniel. Congratulations. All right. Families of faith. So the family unit, as we all know, was designed by God to serve in the, in the plan of redemption and restoration through physical and spiritual multiplication. Today, unfortunately, this design has not gone as smooth as planned. You guys agree with that? Has not gone as smooth as planned. We go all the way back to Cain and Abel, the first family feud, right? However, God has always had a remnant in the family circle to carry the torch of salvation. Today, culture has made a huge back on the family in the form of traditions. Culture and tradition is why many today observe Sunday instead of the Sabbath. Okay, so I like this uh, paragraph at the, at the bottom of the introduction page. It says, the great news is that the power of the gospel gives us, gives us light, comfort, and strength to deal with the challenges that culture can bring. This week, we will look at how we can, can be families of faith as we seek to become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So that's the goal, is to look to Christ and our families, even though this world may seem and look like it's, it's crumbling, which it is, our families can be that beacon of light through the grace of God. So let's look at Sunday's lesson. Hold fast what is good. Hold fast what is good. Culture has the ability to create barriers, okay, especially in religion. The same holds true in the world of Christianity where Christ is, to, is supposed to be the center of all that we think and do. Unfortunately, even in our church, we find prejudices and barriers, even in our church that tend to separate. So here's my question to you. What are a few barriers and or prejudices we might deal with as a whole in the church and what's, and what's the remedy to breaking these walls down? What's some, what's some prejudices or some, some, some barriers? Because our, as a church, we have a, we have a message, right? We have the three angels message, which a lot, of, a lot of the world, they, they don't know. It's in the Bible, but they don't know exactly what it is. So how, how have we created some barriers, so to speak? What's some, what's some things? I got a few written down here. Now, this, that, what did you say, brother? That's exactly what I, you said legalism? Yep. That's what I have written down. Okay. So we are... What makes us, and let me put it another way. What keeps us from going to, let's just say his name is Johnny, 
who's a drug dealer. What, what, what keeps us, we know he needs help, we know he needs Jesus, what keeps us from going to him? Maybe some prejudices, oh, he's a drug dealer, he's not going to listen to me, right? He don't want any help. You ever, you ever, said, you ever uh, looked at a, a family member and said, oh, there's no way they're going to make it? Be honest now, I'm, I, I've said that's the, <laughs> he's so far gone, I don't know how, it, but it's not us that's doing it, it's Jesus Christ. And all we have to do is plant the seed through faith. Uh huh. Let me get to you right quick, bro. So we put ourselves in position of God and saying, they're, you know, they're not going to, we don't want them to make it in almost in a sense like that. Like, we decide who gets to go. We don't go because we think we pick who goes. That's right. That's right. So we, we tend to put ourselves in God's position, and that is not what we want to do. So you said legalism. They're a different denomination. How about that one? They're in a, they're in a different denomination. So, so let me just give you, give you guys a little background. I came from Jehovah Witness background. Grew up Jehovah Witnesses, okay? And uh, never knew that God would lead me over, over to Adventism. Never knew. Until somebody decided to witness to me. I was in college at the time. He decided to witness to me. And guess what? My heart opened. The Holy Spirit touched me. And the rest is history. You see? So different denominations, different than trusting God in the process. Ethnicity, that's a big one. Ethnicity, what color are you? Right? Sad but true. This is, I'm telling you guys the truth. Diet, oh, they still eat meat. I can't talk to them. Right? Jewelry, that's a big one. That's a big one. Okay? Now, let's check out Acts. We're not going to read all. Actually, we're just going to hit the highlights. Acts 10, 1 through 28. You guys know what happened in Acts 10, 1 through 28? Remember, Peter had a dream. Peter had a dream. And um, what did God tell Peter when he had this dream of all these, these, these beasts and, and everything? I, heard, I saw you, your lips moving, sister. It was the food and what they thought they could eat and what they couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was unclean. Were they un unclean foods? Okay. And Peter said, Lord, pretty much he said, I, I, I can't, you know, we don't eat unclean foods. But people look at that, that text and say, you know, it was talking about food, which it wasn't. So in the end, we have Cornelius, which was sent to which was who was was Cornelius in in the fold of faith what was he a Gentile right what was Peter Peter was a Jew so what, what what's the what's the common what's the um the barrier there well say that again Jews do not mix with Gentiles and then in the end what did God say that's right which means, break it down for me, which means what? In, spirit, in the spiritual context. Let me get to you real quick. All people are worthy of heaven. All, all people are worthy of Christ. So that, that's when, was that when the torch passed from the Israelites to the whole world? Was that when that barrier was broken, broken down? Because the Jews had plenty of time to spread the news, but they dropped the ball. And, 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 and God said, you know what? I have a people out there that will take this torch and run with it. They will spread the gospel for me. And that's exactly what happened. Paul came in, okay? Uh, Silas came in, and they, it, it just went crazy, right? <clears throat> All right. Oh, let me go back to the question um, where we talked about the barriers. What's the remedy to breaking these walls down? Give me one couple of remedies to breaking these walls down. We, we, we named some points. Say that one more time. To bring them out in the open to face our barriers and to just break them down. I don't know how else to say it. Okay. okay. What can we do individually? So if you have, let's say you, one of these things you struggle with, right? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you struggle with one of these things. And if somebody in the church 
that you're uncomfortable and you know that God is calling you to go to them or somebody outside the church, you know God is calling you to do something, what do you do to break down that barrier? Well, you take, it's real simple. You take action. You actually pray about it first. Ask God to give you wisdom in speaking to this person or wisdom in breaking down whatever is, is the barrier that is inside of you because a lot of it is, we, 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 we cultivate a lot of it in growing up. I, I believe, in the home, okay? That's where it starts. We know family practices, family culturism starts in the home. So it's learn. It's a learned behavior. So we have to break that. And believe it or not, that is what a lot of times is keeping people out of the church, okay? That's what, you know, if somebody, and I've heard stories since I've been in the Adventist church. I've heard stories. Um, Believe it or not, my wife is, has experienced some things, you know, when, when it comes to barriers. So uh, it, it happens. It happens. All right. Let's look at Acts 15. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Acts 15, starting at verse 19. Um, Acts 15, starting at verse 19. All right, it says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So this is after the torch has been passed to the Gentiles. And this, who is this talking? I believe it is Peter. But it is one of the Jews for sure. Okay. And then verse 20, but, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled from blood. Jump down to 28 and 29. It says, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that they abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves you should do well fare ye well okay speaking of barriers it says here because God shows no partiality Christians are called to treat everyone I don't care what color you are I don't care what you eat I don't care you know how you dress everyone with respect and integrity, giving them a chance to embrace the good news that is for them as well. Okay? So God is calling us to, there's no partiality when it comes to our, our faith. Everybody, you know, one of my prayers is, Lord, let me, give me the eyes of Christ today. I want to see people as you see them, and when we see people as, as he sees them, it's a whole different, it's a whole paradigm shift, okay, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ponder this question here. This is the pink question at the bottom. We're not going to discuss it because we're going to go to the next uh, section. Ponder this. How much of your faith shaped by your culture? How much of your faith is shaped by your culture? And how much is biblical truth? Okay, we're talking about barriers. How can you learn to discern between the two? All right. So think about that. What, how much of your faith is shaped by culture or, or do you have those barriers that you grew up with? Let's look at Monday's lesson. So we're building on top of what we've been talking about. The power of culture on family. Let me give you a definition for culture. Culture is the customs, the arts, the social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social groups. Here's some synonyms. Lifestyle, customs, community, and society. Now this, this right here was a shocker. Here on page, uh, on Monday's lesson, speaking of culture, this was uh, really, um, really crazy to me, or not, not a crazy, but this is culture. It says here, in one ancient culture, it was deemed a, a man's responsibility to eat the corpse of his dead parents. 
That's, that, that stuff really happens. That's their culture. That's, that's what they're taught. And you think about other cultures. For example, I mean, we're, we're going to, uh, in October, by God's grace, we're going to Dubai. Okay? Dubai has culture. There's certain things that we're finding out now that you can't wear, especially women. You can't expose certain body parts. That's their culture. That's, their, that, that's, what, they, that's what they, you know, learned over the, over the generations. Culture is the building block of diversified families. Let me say that one more time. Culture is the building block of diversified families. And diversified families are the building blocks of society. So you want to know how society operates? Look at their culture. Look at where they came from. Look at the family home. Look at the home. Let me ask you a question. Does culture drive tradition? How so? If your culture says you, you eat this way or you pray this way, that just, tradition, just it's the same thing over and over and over. It's a tradition, you might say. Yeah. That's true. Because there's, just because they're different from me, it doesn't mean they're wrong in what they do. I respect them for what they believe in. Okay. okay. Respect is the big word. It's the, it's the key word there. Respect, no partiality. <clears throat> there you go. Amen. The golden rule. We, we we keep that in we keep that in our minds. Then everything would be would be just fine. So we know that culture starts where. In the home, passed down through many many generations. Some cultures have arranged marriages. Strong cultures usually carry strong religious beliefs. Okay, so let's look at a few cultural scenarios in the Bible. Let's look at um. Genesis 16, Genesis 16, 1 through 3, Genesis 16, 1 through 3, does anyone have that? You got that brother? Genesis 16, 1 through 3. It says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall, train, shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. All right. Yeah, yeah. Give me that one. So... What was the culture here? What was dysfunction? Absolutely. Uh, polygamy. So did this? Did did the children of Abraham and Sarah and Sarah did they follow suit on some of this on polygamy? Because it started in the home. Culturism. Okay. Let's look at another account. Look at 1 Kings 11.1. 1. And folks, polygamy is still today in the world. <laughs> it's still going on. 1 Kings 11.1. 1. Oh, oh let, me, let me get back to you, brother. Are <laughs> you okay? But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. All right, so what was the culture there? Continued polygamy, yeah. Continued polygamy. And we know where, Baba doesn't say what happened to Saul in the end, but, that, but women was one of his, why is this man in the world? 
And uh, it was his downfall, women, okay? With culture also comes deep roots that can be different, that can be difficult to uproot. What are a few things in your culture, speaking to you guys individually, you had to give up for your faith in Christ? Now we're going to dig a little deep. What are some of the things you had to give up for your faith in Christ? It's dealing with culture. Dealing with culture. There was a lot of things that I had to unlearn. Um, I mean, stereotypes or even like racial bias, like just just assumptions, in, improper assumptions, things that I learned in my in my family of origin that aren't true. Um, that, that don't really speak to Christ's heart. Um, attitudes towards people of other, other races or, or other faiths. Um, I had to, had to unlearn those things to partake in the body, be a part of the body of Christ. All right. That's a huge one right there. Um, growing up, I kind of had some of the same experiences, you know, um, Racial remarks, you know, just this is, I'm hearing this from other family members, and I'm like, man, what's the, you know, what's the big deal, you know? And and when I was growing up in school, I had all types of friends, all different ethnicities. But that barrier, and I couldn't, you know, as a kid, I I didn't have any hatred toward the other race, but I knew that that wasn't going to stop me from from you know when I got older. When it's going to stop me from following Christ, but it, it stops a lot of people. Any other cultural barriers you had to let go of growing up, so that you can follow Christ, because we got to break down those barriers. Christ, you got to have, you got to let Christ break down those barriers to follow Him all the way. Anybody else? All right. Well, they don't do it the way I do it, then they're not right. Okay. Uh, they shouldn't be that way because everybody has their own way of dealing with life and the way and um, presenting themselves to the Lord and all this. Because I don't care what color you you are. I don't care what nationality you are. You still a brother in Christ to me, and I love you. You know. That's... Amen. And that's how it should be. None of us, bottom of the page of, of Monday's lesson, none of us live in a, in a vacuum. All of us and our families are impacted by, by the culture in which we live. Our responsibility, this is key right here, as Christians is to exist within our culture the best we can, keeping that which is in harmony with our faith, while shunning as much possible the, that which conflicts with it. Okay? So we're living in this society with different cultures. Even in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there is many different cultures. And um, the only thing we defend, the only thing we defend is not our tradition. The only thing we defend is when it conflicts with our faith. Okay? So we should have the motivation. If, I don't care if someone's a Jehovah Witness or a Baptist uh, or vice versa, we should have the motivation to, to, to sit at the same table as them, to, to, to dine with them. They're brother and sister in Christ too. Remember, God has people in all churches. But in, in, in Revelation it says, come out of here, my people. There, there's, there's going to be a shaking, folks, and people are going to come out of Babylon, and, and people are, are searching. Okay? So got to break down those barriers. Tuesday's lesson. Sustaining families through seasons of change. Change is one of those inevitable, inevitable uh, deals that will eventually happen in our lifetime. In regards to family, change can break a family down or build it up. One of the two is going to happen. Different cultures will always experience various changes. Think about the changes you and your family experience, whether good or bad. 
How do you cope or, or how do you remain neutral in tough situations? Okay, so we've all experienced that. Um, let's look at a, a different, a couple of different accounts of different cultures with different but real experiences. Let's look at Genesis. Actually, let's talk about Daniel 1. I like Daniel chapter 1. We're not going to read the whole thing there, but uh, what happened in Daniel chapter 1? Anyone know? Nebuchadnezzar did what? He, he captured the children of Israel. He put them in slavery. Was this God's plan? It, it, it was God's plan to put them in. It was a lesson for them. Okay? And then, what happened next? Daniel, they were presented some food. And what did Daniel and his, his friends do? Said, we don't eat that stuff, man. We, we don't, we're not going, we're not going to eat the king's meat. <clears throat> and this was one of the servants of, of Nebuchadnezzar said, you need to eat this because I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> you need to eat this stuff. And then he said, hey, Daniel said, hey, give us some time. I want you to feed us vegetables. And you'll see how, how, how better we come out. That's, I'm just giving you the, 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 the highlights here. Okay. So what was the change that happened? Let me, these are three, um, three subtitles I have. Change, what was the change that happened? What was the reaction? And what was the coping mechanism? Maybe you can put yourself here um, in, a, in a different situation. And uh, what was the coping mechanism? So what was the change that happened was they were captured. That was a big shift. They was put into slavery, so to speak. Okay? What was the reaction? What was the reaction to being, to being um, put in slavery? Or what was the reaction to being offered, okay, the king's meat or vice versa? What, what did they do? Standing firm. Okay? Standing firm. Was there any coping mechanisms here? Say that one, hold on one second, brother. Okay. Say that one more time. Yeah, there was a difference because in that story, the, 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 when the servant asks Daniel, I'll tell Daniel about the food, and Daniel said, oh, give me the vegetable and water and so forth. After a couple of days, when Daniel and, and his friends were better in health and everything than there was the, eat the king's meat. So it was good. It was very good, very good. And um, Daniel and his, you know, the story goes on, Daniel and his friends became very highly favored in the kings, uh, in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Let's look at a, one more account. Uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 12, one through five. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 5. All right, and it reads, Now the Lord said unto Ab Abram, get thee, up, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be, be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Verse 5. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So what was the change here in these few verses? What was the change here? Abram and his, and his family were... Okay, taken to another place. What was the major change, though, the shift? What, what were they... Would you say they were already in kind of a comfort zone, so to speak? They were wealthy. Uh-huh. He was a tycoon. 
he, I mean, he had l lots of land and, and animals, and it would it would be like if Warren Buffett just left everything and went to some other country, just le and left everything that he had here, and just was like whatever. Just he just left, just took his family and left. Nothing. Just left, turned his back on it all, pretty much. Think about that, folks. Uh, what would you do? What would you do? God said, get, get up, get up out of Tulsa. I want you to go to Egypt. I'm just giving you an example. <laughs> but this pretty much what he did. He's going to somewhere he don't know where he's going. Trusting God completely. A lot of times, God has to tell us to get up or get out of the country for a season so to get our attention. We may be in that comfort zone, that bubble, like, oh, everything is going great, you know, smooth. God would tell us that for our benefit. So what was the reaction when he said, get, get up, get, get up out of there? This reaction, what did he do? He went through it. The Bible said, he, it, it, it doesn't even say that he, you know, said, why, Lord? Or he didn't complain. He just, he just went. That's true faith right there. And then you think about coping mechanism. Coping mechanism is more for your personal. Maybe God has told you to get up out somewhere. Okay, how do you cope with that? How do you cope with that? With change comes, say that again, brother. Prayer, that's right. That's the best coping mechanism, prayer. Asking God for understanding, asking God for wisdom. With change comes the experience of loss and anxiety of uncertainty as to one's immediate future. Depending on the family's ability to adjust to change, these experiences can propel people to new levels of growth. So change can be, you know, people, you hear people say change is good. I like change because it, it helps you to, you know, it gives you experience. And we know experience gets, get, helps you to grow. These experiences can propel people to new levels of growth and appreciation for spiritual things, or they can lead to stress and anxiety. There's one or the other. And listen to this right here. Satan exploits the disruption change brings, hoping to introduce doubt and distrust in God. Okay? So when you feel that God is shifting you over or he's telling you to do something and it's a big change in your life, a big leap of faith, Maybe he's telling you, um, I don't want you to do this job no more that you work. I want you to do something else. That's a big change because you're supporting your family, right? But trusting God, because what, what the enemy wants you to do, he wants you to doubt God. Say, you know, why you don't want me to work this job no more? I've been here for 25 years. But, hey, it happens. Got to trust God. The promises of God's word, the resources of family and friends, and insurance the assurance that their lives were in God's hands helped many, many heroes and hero, heroines of faith cope successfully with momentous, momentous life upheavals. Okay? So, so these, these men and women of faith, these men and women of faith had great faith in, in the Lord. My, my personal experience is I, I grew up in Jamaica for years. I have a good job. I married and for 30 something years, and things are, things are okay. I have no plan to come to the States. And years ago, I got, I got blind. And I'm here. I said to God, Why I'm here? I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here. And I know God's going to use me to help others to come to know Him as Savior. That's why I'm here. Amen, brother. So all the way from Jamaica. Yeah, from Jamaica. Wow. Everything was going fine, but God said it's time. Abraham experience right here, folks. Real life. It happens all the time. And you follow what God told you to do, and, and he's going to use you, brother. He's going to use you. Wednesday's lesson toward a first-generation faith. <clears throat> I was going to read Judges 2. Actually, we can briefly look at it because it is a critical story. Judges 2, chapter, uh, starting verse 13. 
I'm sorry, Judges 2, starting at verse 7. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that I live, Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that, that he did in Israel. And Joshua died. I'm just going to kind of give you the, the rundown. Joshua died, and there was another generation that came up. Now, the generation in Joshua's time served the Lord with him. This other generation that came up, what happened? They didn't know him. They didn't know the Lord, and they departed from him. After Joshua died, then the elders who were with Joshua, they died and died off. And so that generation that came didn't know anything about God. That's right. Side of the Lord, right here, it's the name for Sir God. So, now you look at that. You, you look at that account. I was amazed by that. How could that have happened? If Joshua, strong man of faith, because we know we can pass down. It only takes one. It only takes one to create a generation. Okay. So how can a, how can that that torch of faith be broken? How does that happen? Somebody failed to pick up the torch. Somebody in Joshua's household, maybe? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm saying it wasn't continued on, or you might say, I don't They did, and they started serving other gods. They started serving other gods. All right. We've all been, has anyone been, had the prodigal son experience? I'm not the only one, Emma. <laughs> well, I believe we all have some type of prodigal son experience. Think about this. Think about. Uh huh. Yeah. As her son, and I love this woman dearly. And um, yeah, that's my mom. Um, but uh, I love my dad, but he was not like that. But anyway, my mom, she was always there to take me in, no matter what I did. And I did some pretty bad things. But anyway, well, thanks. Well, thanks be to God, man. You're here. Mm-hmm. All right. So listen to this here. Actually, I uh, like this. This question right here kind of threw me for a loop. Second question on Wednesday's lesson says, it has, it has been said that God has no grandchildren, only children. What do you think this means? What do you think this means? So think about it. Does God have grandchildren? Huh? No. So let me break it down to you what that means. So you have you, the believer, and your kid is a non-believer, for example. That means spiritually, you're the, you, the believer, you're, you're the daughter, you're the son, and the, one is, the, the, the child that's not a believer is like a grandchild, spiritually speaking, to God, which and, and, and to, break it down, to break it down a little further, is talking about mama, daddy, auntie, their faith cannot save no one else. Okay? That's what that's really what it's really coming coming down to. What you you know, you've heard it before and I've heard it many times growing up. You know, well my, my grandma said this and this is what I believe. Okay? Well this is I'm gonna go out to what they believe. It's it's Everybody has to have their own personal experience with Christ. Christ is not going to come when, he, when, he, when judgment time comes. He's not going to come and say, you know what, since your mom believed this way, you know, you, I'm, you're saved. It doesn't, work, it doesn't work like that. So God has no grandchildren. What was that, brother? 
I suppose he's <laughs> going to save you either. You have to stand on your... <laughs> your spouse can't save you either. So we have to have that personal relationship. Go by, yep, that's right. Each one needs to know Christ for himself or herself. Parents can do only so much. So now we have a part to play in our homes. We, 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 we can be, the Bible says, we can be a stumbling block, unfortunately, okay? So we have to be careful. If, if we claim to be Christ followers, we have to uh, trust in him and, and walk the walk, okay? And that, that can be a witness to people around us, our families, our friends, etc. So we have to be, say, what, if we say what we say, we got to do what we do. The church as a whole, and parents in particular, need to do all they can to create an environment that will make young people want to make the right choice. But in the end, a generation, just like we read in Judges, a generation is saved or lost for the gospel one person at a time. So the downfall of, of Joshua's generation was someone in there in the, in the mix dropped the ball. That, they, there wasn't, the, the, the Christian atmosphere in the home was, was, wasn't there. Christ wasn't in the home. So the generation, that generation didn't know God. That generation didn't know God. Here's a scenario that I like. This is down at the bottom of page uh, Wednesday's lesson, the pink section. Joe, coming out of atheism, joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a adult after a powerful conversion experience. He married an Adventist woman and had a few children, whom they, of course, raised in faith. One day, thinking about the spiritual condition of his children, he said, Oh, if only my children would have the experience that I had. Would you wish that on your children? Absolutely not. What is he saying? He's saying, I wish they would become atheists too. <laughs> no, you don't want you know, you don't want that. What you're doing now, Joe, in the home, because you're of your conversion experience with, with Christ, is where you want to be. Because this is very high, it's very risky if you want your children to be like you want to be. We, we want to, we learn from our mistakes. We don't go backwards and say, okay, let's just rewind and, and try to make it like, like it used to be. All right. We're about out of time. Let me close with this. I'm going to read, this is from Friday's, uh, Friday's lesson. Uh, it's, it's actually a quote from Sister White in Gospel Workers, page 30. It says, no respect of persons with God. The religion of Christ uplifts the receiver to a higher plane of thought and action, while at the same time it presents the whole human race as alike the objects of the love of God being purchased by the sacrifice of his son. At the feet of Jesus, the rich and the poor, the learned and the ignorant meet together with no thought of caste or worldly preeminence. All earthly distinctions are forgotten as we look upon, look upon him whom our sins have pierced. The self-denial, the condescension, the infinite compassion of him who, who was highly exalted in heaven puts to shame human pride, self-esteem, and social caste. Pure, undefiled religion manifests itself, heaven-born principles in bringing into oneness all who are sanctified through the truth. All meet as blood-bought souls alike dependent upon him who has redeemed them to God. Amen. All right. Thank you all for your comments. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your words to us this morning. Lord, my prayer this morning is for all of us to break down whatever barriers, Lord, is keeping us from spreading the gospel, Lord. Help us, Lord, at this time to become more like Jesus. Lord, your word says that we can have the mind of Christ, and, and we believe that wholeheartedly. Forgive us, Lord, where we have fallen short of your glory. And, Lord, we pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit so that we will be changed to the likeness of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.